welcome, folks. Uh, we're up to episode eight of season 12 of Mentioned and Dispatches. And when we get to the spring, around the middle of the season, uh, it's pretty reliable that we're going to have an episode or two that features some of the folks from the professional wargaming community. So we try to sync this up around the same time that Connections Online starts to appear on the calendar. And, uh, you know, lo and behold, here we are uh, approaching end of March, early April, as we are getting close to Connections Online, uh, which means we got to bring back the guy in charge of Connections Online. So, Chris, Chris Weave is back again. Chris, how you doing? Um, I'm doing pretty good, except I've caught that cold that's going around, um, and uh, you should avoid it if you can. But other than that, I'm doing great. Yes. Chris, please do not spread any computer viruses. Um, joining us for the first time here on Mention and Dispatches, although no stranger to the professional wargaming community, uh, Pete Pellegrino is here. Sir, how are you tonight? I am well. Uh, it, it, end of a long day. We've been, you know, workshops and stuff going on at the War College, but otherwise, uh, good. And so for the folks that folks know where Chris has been and like, you know, he doesn't speak for his employer. They don't speak for him. We're not anticipating the same for you. Um, you're, you're at one of the War Colleges, as you mentioned. You've also, over the years, you've got 20 odd years worth of professional wargaming under your belt at this point though, right? That is correct. Yeah. And uh, I stumbled into it. Uh, I, I started at the War College when I was still active duty Navy. I uh, showed up there in 2004. Uh, then, uh, and I wasn't supposed to go to wargaming. Uh, I was on my way over to the teaching faculty when the personnel department screwed up <laughs> and the position I was going to take, uh, uh, the the officer I was replacing, he extended. And so because he didn't leave, you know, his job wasn't open and they didn't know what to do with me. So the basic idea was, look, how about we stick you in wargaming as a temporary thing and we'll work it out later. Okay. So that was 2004 i'm still in war gaming so. <laughs> <laughs> i you, you know look it could be considered temporary when you eventually finally decide to change and go back to whatever you're supposed to do <laughs> right we call it act three because i'm on act two right now yeah because i saw so i retired in 2007 uh and basically just kind of went from you know one uh, one of the war gaming uh, cubicles in a uniform to two down to the left in a coat and tie yeah yeah See, well he, di- he, part he, dis- he disappeared for a month and came back with a beard well there was that part yeah. because <laughs> Because that's what Navy guys do when they retire. That's how we mark our retirement is we all immediately grow facial hair. Well, it's it's that or you get on a submarine and grow the facial hair, one or the other. So so, so as, as you can guess from the fact that I jumped in there, Pete and I actually worked together at the War yes, College. We did. I was there from 2005 to 2010. And it was funny, Pete is such a natural to the position, picked it up like a fish in water, um, such a natural to the position that I constantly, yeah, I, I remember our, our, uh, our boss's boss in, in, in some intro or something, he talked about how Pete had been, you know, Pete had been wargaming since he was a kid or something like that. And I went up afterwards and said, that's, that's not true. <laughs> That is correct. Pete, Pete, Pete wasn't a war gamer until he got here. And the response I got was, really? Are you serious? It's like, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, Pete's one of those guys who just, he picked it up right away, immediately understood how all the pieces fit together, um, went from uh, having to be told that war gaming was one word to being able to say, this, you know, this is what you you shouldn't do when you're designing a game and this is how you should do it. And the Pellegrino Cross is how he explained all that stuff, et cetera, et cetera. You know, he went from he went from a cold start to being an expert in the field in what, 18 months? Something well, like that. what I what I learned to do is, again, a mutual colleague of ours, Stephen Downs Martin, uh, I my first assignment uh, was a was with him uh, as my my, <laughs> my my analyst. Right? He just threw you right in the deep end. Yeah, kind of. And uh, but what? I, and, and again, Stephen, you know, self admits that he has the social skills of flesh eating bacteria. And what I found was if I could just repeat what Stephen said in a way that didn't irritate people, I was golden. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I could see how that that would work to your advantage. <laughs> so, oh yeah, that was yeah, that was true. I mean, Chris said my gaming background is yeah. I had a bit of a little bit of a you know gaming background in terms of you know I played Risk as a kid, but I, I kind of joke that was the extent of it. You know, I Risk Stratego. I, I think I just covered it chess, uh, but yeah, I, again, just kind of fell into it. And then it was one of those happy circumstances in terms of or, or coincidences where I was at the War College, um, and that month I disappeared. Uh, part of that was in between, as I retired and I came back but when i came back i came back uh, as a contractor but the college didn't immediately pick up you know to expand the contract to 
pick me up on full time. So uh, the extra time that I wasn't at the work college, uh, I ended up doing some business war gaming for like Fortune 500 companies. Oh, wow. Uh, which was, again, just kind of a happenstance. I just kind of fell into that. Uh, and again, that was an interesting experience because I was able to start to take the, you know, my at that point, only three years of, of military war gaming and do the whole, okay, so we've always said that gaming is gaming. It's just the context that changes. Is that true? So I took a lot of what I'd learned at the college uh, off to, to a couple of different businesses who were trying to use gaming techniques to understand their their, their competitive space, uh, their, their market opportunities and stuff. And it's like, yeah, it does work for them too. And then from that, I fell in with Hasbro uh, for a little bit in terms of just doing some consulting and outside inventor work for Hasbro for a while. And that was the, that was the check of, okay, so what about the commercial side? You know, commercial entertainment gaming, does that fit within the professional skill set as well? And it all does. So it was all kind of uh, sympathetic or, or, or synergistic. Yeah. We're going to circle back around to both some of the business and the commercial side of things a little bit. I, I do want to go back to your whole sort of, I stumbled into it. I fell into it. it. It's interesting that, so only now are we starting to see some more deliberate pathways really laid down for people mm -hmm. who want to go into professional gaming, uh, you know, in, in this practitioner space where folks like uh, Sebastian at Georgetown with the, yeah. the, intro to wargaming class there or some of the other um you know chris wheaton had some stuff like that up at mercyhurst for a while before he left for the army war college but but you're starting to see in a couple of places some some deliberate uh academic development towards uh towards some wargaming expertise and and moore's has started to pick up on this a little bit but for folks that are probably over that 30 35 year old line um there's nobody really that i can think of in the professional wargaming space that intended to be in the professional wargaming space everybody you know sort of stumbled back it, it's kind of like being a business analyst in the it world like the person who went to school with a career goal of becoming an an IT business analyst, that person does not exist. Mm -hmm. Every single one of them stumbled into it or backed into it or fell into it by accident from somewhere else. And I think that's true of a ton of war gamers as well. And, uh, it, and so sort of it, Chris, same thing happened with you. You know, you just sort of yeah. you applied for a job and ended up working for Peter Perla one day. Talk about, you know, winning the lottery there. Um, but, you know, it, it, Pete, as you look at it, like you, you admitted it was sort of an accident that you ended up in that space in terms of some of the preparation and the skills that you brought to the table that weren't necessarily wargaming skills, but turned out to be very useful over the long haul. What were some of those things that kind of helped you not just, you know, because obviously you kind of had to enjoy the wargaming stuff, but what were some of the skills that made it, you know, more appealing, more successful for you? Yeah. So when I told my parents where I had kind of landed and what I was doing, uh, both of them were like, well, yeah, duh. And, and, <laughs> well, well, I'm like, wait a second. What do you mean, duh? <laughs> In terms of, I didn't see this coming. How is it that you thought this was a natural fit? And they said, when you were, when you were young, don't you remember you would go and get a, a, a scrap piece of cardboard and, and go and raid pieces from other games we had laying around the house and make other games to play with your brother. And I was like, I did. Okay. <laughs> okay if you say so, I guess I kind of vaguely remember doing that. Uh, and I think it was that, uh, Early, some of those early just knocking around other games but what uh the glue that kind of held all that together was really more from the graphic arts and creative side of things so uh, when i teach part of the uh, wargaming course that we do uh, at the college uh, twice a year one of the topics i kind of point out right or uh, analogies i use is this idea about art the arts and i contrast my my own experience in terms of formal art training so going to university i went to penn state and you had to take so many you know humanity credits and art credits and whatnot i was a uh, biology major and the i took all studio arts so uh 3d design 2d design graphics painting color i i got my hands in there i wanted to do it my wife by contrast was more of the art history person so she can sit there and look at a painting and tell you which Dutch master did it, what the significance of his use of oils and color is, why this is considered a masterpiece. She can't draw a stick figure to save her life. 
<laughs> so I think it was that art side that really helped in terms of that that creative space in being able to take uh, the necessary abstraction steps. Because wargaming, you know, from that professional level, it's you're either starting from nothing and building up, which is a little harder to do until you've been doing it for a while. So most of us start from that that top down approach: is you take what you know about warfare and you figure out what parts you're going to abstract away or cut off, and how do you simplify what's left? And that's, and I think that's kind of an art process because that's, that's, you know, from a, a visual design and communications idea, that's what you're doing. You're trying to think about a complex idea that I have to somehow reduce into simple visual cues that I can represent in some sort of like 2D media to communicate an idea. It's like, gee, that's the challenge we have with, with wargaming. How do I take complex military problems, abstract them down to some simpler representation of them? But in doing that, I can actually communicate perhaps more or understand more than I when I look at the real world problem in its entirety. So I think maybe that's, that's, that's part of what helped me uh, adapt to this job. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it, 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 it's funny with the whole parents, you know, kind of saying, well, duh, you know, because that, that was, you know, a, an area that, that you sort of jumped into for, for the creative side in terms of applying the military knowledge and thought to the, those game contexts. Was that just something that came primarily from your experience in the Navy or was there an, a, a different history interest ahead of that as well? Yeah, there's a little bit, I'd say mostly just uh, 20 plus years in, in the Navy uh, in terms of the, you know, the military planning process. Uh, while on the Navy side, we tend to get introduced to that uh, late in life, but I attended the uh, British War College was what I did for my uh, joint professional military education. And so the, the mechanical process, the step-by-step procedural approach to how do you think about a problem? How do you define it? Uh, how do you understand this implied tasks? It's, it's explicit tasks. How do you start developing those courses of action? How do you think about the intelligence part that you need for all of this? Uh, I think it's an important part of, from a wargaming perspective, having that background uh, helps you look at and decompose military problems, which is uh, you're either doing it because you're a planner and you're somewhere at you know, one of the military commands and you're, and you're trying to do actually do a plans job, or you're a wargamer, you still have to do that same type of deconstruction and understand the pieces parts that compose operational art, as we like to call it. Um, and there was the history part. I mean, I, I ended up spending a fair amount of time uh, researching, and now I, I lecture on it, the interwar period at the War College. Because when, uh, if you're at the War College, if you're involved with war gaming, sooner or later, someone's going to bring up War Plan Orange. And <laughs> if you're at the War College, everyone gets dewy-eyed, the edges of the screen go into soft focus, gentle music plays, and it's this, oh yes, the interwar period, when we are a halcyon days of war gaming at the War College. And I knew nothing about <laughs> War Plan Orange, but I I kept hearing this kind of this mythology around it. And so at some point I said, you know, I should I should read something uh, if I'm going to work here. And this seems to be something that people want to always want to refer to. And so I picked up Ed Miller's book uh, on War Plan Orange uh, and read it through once, read it through a second time. And at one point I started just, you know, taking notes uh, in the margins and started thinking about it in terms of how can I take how can I make a book report? <laughs> That's kind of what I ended up doing. Uh, and so I, I put together a little presentation and it was more just, again, for internal, for the department, it says, hey, if you're curious about War Plan Orange, um, I don't think the story is exactly the way it tends to get told around the college, but it's still a useful story to understand. And my intro to when I give the talk uh, is I liken War Plan Orange uh, and the way we talk about it at the college to the way we talk about Thanksgiving, you know, as a national holiday. And there's the imagery that goes with Thanksgiving, the turkey, the you know, the the belt buckle hats, the black and white outfits, the Puritans kind of thing, the Wampanoag Indians, uh, and the history of it, especially if it's here in Rhode Island, because we're at ground zero for King Philip's War here. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, the the actual history is not quite so you know so celebratory uh, after you get past about the first fifty years of the the colonists hanging out here in, in New England. So, but it's still important. The myth part is still important because it in in some ways informs what we want to be. You know, the the ideals of the American character um, and how Thanksgiving tries to embody some of that. It's our least commercialized holiday. So even though we've mythologically we're mythothized to come up with the word there. Mythologized. Thank you. I'll go with that. 
study <laughs> the holiday, um, it's that is still valuable just as its actual history is still important to understand. So that's how I kind of lead in with Warfland Orange. It's the college's Thanksgiving. We've got a lot of myth around it about how like, you know, the college figured out how to defeat Japan in World War II. Eh, the, the reality is, is a little less exciting. Uh, we, play, we, we played an important role. We didn't play the role. <laughs> We didn't write the plan at the college. Uh, but again, my history interest there is kind of what informed that. And now that's become a whole secondary thing is that uh, at least a couple, two, three times a year, I give this Warplan Orange talk. Uh, and I think the reason it's it's stuck around, so to speak, in terms of, of how often I'm asked to do it, is I think there's a little bit of a, I don't want to say cautionary tale, but there is a tendency today from the for people looking in at professional wargaming to oversimplify what we do and simply say things like, oh, well, can't we just replicate uh, the war game <laughs> we did in you know 1920 to 1937 and figure out how to defeat our current adversaries and just do that. And I I have to point out to people the only the reason that war gaming worked as well as it did in the 20s and 30s is that it was part of a, what I call the ecosystem. It wasn't just the gaming. It was the fact that we also had the fleet battle experiments going on. We had OpNav, with it, which was still relatively new, with its own war plans division. You couldn't get to the war plans division unless you were a war college grad. The war college curriculum was 90% wargaming centric. So we were spitting out students who, were, who had spent uh, almost a full year just doing war games, repetitive. And then we were sending them off to be those fleet commanders who then did those fleet battle experiments. We were sending them to all the bureaus, so Bureau of Aeronautics, uh, Bureau of Navigation, Bureau of Weapons. You know, uh, and from there, uh, the technology piece was meeting up with the actual field experimentation piece, was meeting up with the theoretical piece down to the War College, uh, is being tested out in wargaming at uh, OpNav from a war plans perspective. And around all of it is the, the, the general board, which no longer exists. So it's because we had all of that going on and we had our students as the vehicles to disseminate wargaming knowledge throughout the fleet that made it work. So you can't just go and pluck the war college piece out, drop it into, you know, into today's uh, naval environment in terms of the relationship with OpNav, the way the fleets function, where post where Goldwater Nichols, the change in relationship with the fleet commanders. So it's not just that straight lift from, well, the way we did it in the past, we can just do it now. Not that we couldn't do it better now, but yeah. that's, you know, that's part of the problem. Yeah. One of the things about it is, is that it was because it was part of the curriculum, nobody like said, oh, how do we do a wargaming thing? Right. It, it's yeah. it, it was just there. It was just part of the curriculum. And pretty much the entire Navy officer corps went to the war college. Um, I think there were two flag officers in the Pacific who were not war college grads. Yeah, I think uh, there's only two. one. Yeah, just one. Oh, maybe it might have been one. Okay, yeah, I, I, I stand corrected. <laughs> and so, so the end result of that is, is so it, it wasn't like, well, we need to come up with this thing that will sort of graft onto things. Um, the now, now I've worked for the Navy in one way, shape, or form for about twenty years. Um, I now work for somebody else, but I spent a lot of time working with and for the Navy. Um, and I love the U.S. Navy, although sometimes the Navy makes it really hard. Um, <laughs> and one of the things I've noticed about the Navy, um, bless them, is that that there's this tendency to adopt the conclusion slide while rejecting the assumption slide, and so. So if you go to them and say, oh, yeah, you want that? Well, here's what it's going to cost. And they'll say, yeah, but I don't want to pay that. I want to get the benefit of it, but I don't want to pay that cost. So how about we do like one tenth of what you said? You, you've just described every single person on a weight loss and, and exercise regimen yeah, yeah. in the entire country. Like you, you've you just described, you know, 90 percent of America's New Year's resolutions well, right yeah, there. And, yeah. and, 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 but but it's it's a recurring theme. Like at one point, the the army had a particular course um, and I can't remember what it's called now off the top of my head that was doing producing some really, really well qualified operators. But it was taking them like a year. And the Navy's response is, we want that, but we're going to do it in six weeks. Well, guess what? They didn't get those results because it was only six weeks. Um, that's kind of a recurring theme. And so as 
anybody who's in the professional wargaming business knows very well that wargaming is a pendulum. Professional wargaming is a pendulum. And it cycles back and forth between being everybody, you know, oh, yeah, we got to do wargaming. We got to do wargaming. We got to do wargaming to um, don't tell me about that wargaming shit. <laughs> And, and it cycles back and forth on yeah, maybe about a 10 year cycle on that. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, okay, so that's a gross generalization. You know, it's not exactly like that, but it does have, have a tendency to wax and wane. And then in addition to that, wargaming is an ill-defined term. It's not actually covered in the joint documents anymore. There used to be a wargaming definition, but for some reason they took it out of the dictionary. That is indeed true. Yeah. And well, it's not just that it's ill-defined, it's used as an yeah. accurate label label on like six different things yeah well we call yeah. it a big tent right if wargaming is a big tent <laughs> And, and then you've got things like phrases like advanced wargaming. And, and, you know, a lot of people think that when, you know, if I'm talking about a war game, I'm talking about some sort of computer simulation program. And, and what I care about is the, is the answer. It's like, you know, if I, if I just had, if I just had enough detail in my war game, it will give me, um, it will tell me if my war plan is good enough. And, and it's like that, that drives me crazy. War games for analytical purposes, war games are not, analysis war games generate data that needs to undergo analysis to be turned into knowledge and the outcome of any particular war game is just one data point in that regard and um frequently you know your war game your war game has objectives that come out of a problem statement and those objectives how well you meet those objectives determine how successful your game is and um, frequently, the best way to meet those objectives is to design a game that is not quote unquote realistic, but rather it's fit for purpose, right? So like if you're doing, if you're testing stuff related to air combat, you don't necessarily want to have a big ground component in your game because it's just going to distract the players to go and do stuff. And somebody will come along and say, well, you didn't include the ground game and some of the red, red would have been doing ground stuff. And it's like, yeah, and I don't want them doing ground stuff. I want them, I want them doing air stuff because that's the part I'm testing. Um, I always say that wargaming, there's two different kinds of wargaming. There's wargaming that's like developmental test and there's wargaming that's like operational test. Operational testing is to determine if the thing that you're going to buy does what it claims it does, right? So, you know, I'm going to buy this tank. Can I use this thing as a tank? Is it Does it meet the survivability requirements? Does it meet the mobility requirements, et cetera, et cetera? Operational test is about breaking the damn thing so you can figure out how it breaks so you can make it less breakable. So operational test is like an eye exam. There are no, you don't win an eye exam, right? You don't pass an eye exam. Well, I guess you do if you're going to be a pilot or something like that. But I mean, just, just when you go to your eye doctor, there are no recorded instances of an eye doctor saying, I've run out of increasingly tiny letters for you to look at. You win, right? It's, <laughs> it is a test to destruction. And so a lot of gaming, a lot of professional gaming is a test to destruction. And the pros understand that. Well, most of them do. <laughs> not all of them, because people come in from various paths and sometimes they're not in the right environment. The environment that they're in has not sort of taken that on board. But I'll go ahead and say it. The good ones do. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. Roger that. Um, the leadership doesn't always get that. And so yeah. a big chunk of being a professional war gamer is figuring out how to educate leadership, uh, including sponsors, but not always sponsors, uh, um, educating leadership on how to think about gaming. And it's not, frequently, it's not a matter of getting people enthused. Frequently, it's a matter of explaining to the enthused guy that he's wrong, um, <laughs> which is always fun especially when they got stars on their shoulders. Yeah. Why well, you want to harsh my mellow, dude? Yeah. Well, I, I think part of what when Chris was talking about the whole, um, you know, just gaming primarily, uh, human decision driven. Right? If I don't have humans involved making decisions, I've got something else, but I don't have a game. And then we get into this argu argument, but it, it's this idea about, and this is the chicken and egg problem within gaming in terms of 
I've got decisions that result in consequences. Based on those consequences, I have to make more decisions. So decision, consequence, decision, consequence. Where do I start the wheel? Do I start with the chicken? Do I start with the egg? Because it makes a little bit of a difference. So when we say that a game primarily wants to start with, here are a set of conditions. What do you do next, Commander? That puts the decision process front and center. The decision is the result. Or do we say, you've made some decisions. Here's what happens, which tends to put the what happens front and center and less so about the decision. Now, each feeds the other. And again, that's why it's a wheel and why it's a little bit of a, of a problem in terms of trying to figure out which should you start with. But our argument has been, at least recently, we've been trying to articulate this way. If you're simply interested in setting a bunch of conditions, making some decisions, coming up with a strategy, getting the council of captains, the big thinkers to, to put together a strategy, and you want to see what happens, well, then that's when we do some of our, our gaming that uses models and simulations, campaign analysis. You set the conditions, you hit the run button, you come back in three days, and see what the boxes spit out, which clearly isn't from a gamer's perspective, much of a game, if any game at all, as opposed to, hey, here's a set of conditions. We're fourth and long. What are you going to do now? What, what's the team going to practice? How are you going to respond to the situation? Now, some people immediately start to say, why am I fourth and long? It doesn't matter why yeah. you're, you're stuck here. This is the situation that you will find yourself in. How do you think your way out of it? And it was, well, I need to know how I got here. No, you don't. <laughs> Because well, because they want to go back and change the conditions that got them into fourth and long. Right. Part of one of the things that one of my colleagues talks about is this idea that one of the, thing, the things that uh, word gaming can be good for is trying to understand where the irreversible and irrecoverable branches are as probability goes forward in time. So if you think of just, you know, you're, you're, we're here in the now. And the further I start to move into trying to guess what's going to happen in the future, the fuzzier it gets. I can probably guess what's going to happen in the next 30 seconds, but I'm not so good at guessing what's going to happen in the next three years. So the that ambiguity horizon you know, gets gooey and fuzzy, the broader this tree of possibility moves out with all these possible branching decisions I can make. So one of the things that gaming tries to do is prune all those possible decision branches. You can get to this point and go left or right. Okay, let's go right. Okay, let's see what happens when I go left, right, left, left, right. Oh, that didn't turn out so good. Okay, well, how bad did it turn out? No, it turned out catastrophic. Huh. So what I'm guessing is you'd rather not repeat that pattern again. So let's figure out what the road signs are that you're starting to go down that pathway. Because if it's if it's truly irreversible, it means you've put yourself now into such a, a extremis, you can't back out, an old, old flyer. And that's like getting into the box canyon, where you fly in the box canyon a little too long, and you're going to find that the train is rising faster than your aircraft can climb, you are going to hit the wall. So you're in an irrecoverable situation. Um, and so you can't back out, and you can't recover from it. I'd rather not be there. So can I game to start to see and understand understand the signposts that start to say, dude, you're headed down towards one of those bad pathways. Let's not continue. And you kind of cut, you now prune that off of your decision tree saying, hey, I went down that path. Um, it, I, I, We can find no good way to, to, to wring benefit from it. So let's cut that one off yeah. of our future thinking. You but learn how to recognize the dead end signs. Exactly. But then I have senior officers say, yes, that's what I want. Keep pruning away all the branches until there's a stick left that goes to victory. Oh, Okay, now my my trimming the bush problem, my analogy just fell apart because I go, well, okay, no, I can't do that. The, the best comeback yeah. I've ever heard to one of those was actually an Air Force captain who was observing at an event at the the war uh, the National Defense University, mm -hmm. and and I was there supporting a thing as a contractor, and and there were a couple of other observers who were in the room doing exactly what you talked about. They're like, you know, I just want them to figure out like what are the right set of decisions we've got to make. To to get all the way through to victory and this captain leaned over to me and said you know if we had that answer we wouldn't need those guys yeah <laughs> right well that's anyone who's, who gets into the uh the hey we can predict it uh, they're they're selling their model or they're selling their approach um, as as working as a reliable predictor. And we and I look at people and say, look, if what they're saying is true, they wouldn't be in this business. They'd be in the stock market. They'd be in sports. Yes. <laughs> there's a whole yeah. lot more money yeah. there. I want to spin this back real quick to what wargaming in Newport in the interwar years actually meant for a second. Because 
Pete talked about War Plan Orange, and War Plan Orange was a big part of it. But the Naval War College, as he said, like 90% of the curriculum was based on wargaming stuff, and they were wargaming at all sorts of different levels. And there's this famous letter that came from uh, Chester Nimitz, right? Yep. Um, and and Pete and I are required by federal law <laughs> to mention that letter <laughs> as former War College employees. We have to mention that letter at least like once a week or so. Yeah, 1965. <laughs> Yeah. And, and it's this letter where he said, we weren't surprised by anything except the kamikaze. Let's put this in context. Yeah. The context of this is they were wargaming at all sorts of different levels. And the war games changed over time. So I'm I'm going to talk broad brush about 30 years of war game. The war games changed over time and they covered all different levels. So it wasn't just like, what should our strategy be? And oh, we've got this this default strategy. Does our operational, when we do the operational game, does that fit in with the strategy? It was also a lot of tactical play. So, and the tactical play frequently changed fundamentals in order to prevent the students from gaming the problem, the gouge, as <laughs> we would say. And so part of that was, you know, like you talk to the guy who was in the class ahead of you and he says oh you know the torpedoes the torpedoes are killer you know guns aren't that big an issue but torpedoes are going to kill you and you talk to the guy in the class before that it's like oh it's all guns it's all guns it's the torpedoes are useless and you know other variations of that it's like did these guys go to the same place and it's like yeah but they didn't play the same game because frequently for those tactical level classes what they were doing was they were constantly changing those variables they were changing the die roll tables that they were rolling against because it wasn't those games were not about being able to execute the game. It was about teaching students how to think through problems on the fly under situations of extreme stress and teaching them how to figure out what world it turns out they were living in. Because we yeah. didn't know, right? Like we hadn't fought the war with those weapons, and so we didn't know. So when Chester Nimitz says there were no surprises, part of what he's saying there is we did every possible combination on the gaming floors in Newport and so you know nothing nothing that happened was a surprise not because wargaming predicted it but because they did everything yeah I mean, we, we joke about how within that time you remember when so Nimitz is a student in 1923 uh, so obviously 20 years are going to go by uh, before he actually has to, to, to do the job and then another uh, give or take 20 years a little less goes by before he's uh, at Spruance Auditorium, or no, he's at Pringle Auditorium, at the War College in 1960, talking to the student body. Uh, and again, this is where also the, the Nimitz or the uh, Kamikaze thing comes up. Um, but when you listen to, and we've got it recorded, and it's part of, uh, it's called the Gray Book, which are all of the uh, personal memoirs and papers of uh, Nimitz that the War College uh, was bequeathed, and we've since digitized. And that's one of our, our digital records. And as you listen to him talk, he's talking about professional military education. And he's trying to put that emphasis on the full quote in terms of the war with Japan had been fought by so many people uh, in so many different ways. And that's the important part, not the, the rest of the that follows. It was it was the diversity of people who had to think through the problem set and the environment they had to think it through and the changing uh, situations. Because, again, here's Nimitz playing with dreadnoughts and biplanes, 1923. Right? That's obviously not the Navy he took to the fight. And. By 1960, he's got a pretty decent sense of hindsight, and uh, he would know, as well as it, 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 probably the best, in terms of everything the war games got wrong. Yeah, The war games got Japanese torpedo performance wrong. We got Japanese naval aviation wrong. Uh, we got night fighting wrong. We got utilization of radar wrong. We got a lot of things wrong. Submarine tactics wrong. Yet, he never said... Oh, well, you know, I gamed in 23. A lot of it was inaccurate. Wargaming didn't tell it really helped me two decades later. He doesn't say that because, again, as Chris has pointed out, it wasn't about trying to memorize the right thing to do if you find yourself west of, of Palau uh, in the Pacific. It's how do I think about problems? What are those mental habits of mind? Is the phrase we like to use that wargaming inculcated because they did it for a year. It wasn't just a one off. Oh, today we'll do a little bit of wargaming. There's no, that's what you did. That's how we talk uh, was through the wargame. Uh, and so yeah. it's that type of thing that, uh, 
built those, uh, the, the built the Halseys, they built the Nimitzes, they built the King. But King, the story we like to tell about King, he's class of 33. Uh, when King is, uh, it's his turn to command in one of the war games. And the faculty tell him, okay, Ernie, um, you've got, you, you've drawn a uh, problem three uh, and you need to do the approach to Japan via the Northern route which is basically hugging the illusions in the Northern Islands. And King doesn't want to do that. He's like, I think that's a, I don't think that's a, a war winning approach. There are better ways to approach Japan. I don't want to do that. I'd rather do the Central Pacific uh, approach for my war. And the faculty's so, oh, so uh, commander at the time, um, you're not listening. <laughs> we need you to do the Northern approach. And the reason why is because it's a curriculum. Again, this isn't, we're not trying to discover uh the way to defeat Japan. Uh, we're just trying to expose the students to a variety of operational, strategic problems or tactical problems that happen to be set in the West Pacific with against Japan, a likely opponent of the United States for a variety of reasons. Uh, and King just keeps pushing back. I don't want to do it. I'm not going to do it. And finally, the faculty says, OK, Commander, um, if you'd like to pass on your chance to command, duly noted. <laughs> <laughs> and King Rabbit goes, okay, hang on, hang on, hang on. Uh, yes. And he acquiesces. Now, it, it, he gets pulled from the course early for different reasons. And he actually uh, apparently had to do the game. But again, it is, to Chris's point, it was a curriculum. We're trying to teach some stuff. And it's not necessarily teaching you how to cross the T as it is she's trying to teach you to think dynamically uh, in a situation with limited information, confused timelines, and and have be comfortable with analyzing a situation. And, and we think, at least I, that's what I think. I think when Nimitz says he's not surprised, it's he didn't get caught on the back foot. He didn't get mm -hmm. caught in a situation that he couldn't reason his way forward from. Yeah. That's... Yeah. Well, there's so there, there's so, a couple of things there. I mean, one, you know, the 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 context that you provide in terms of they they changed every possible condition that they could. It's easy to not be surprised when you cover as many bases as possible. You know, the the likelihood of being surprised goes down. Not that it's impossible, but it's a lot less likely. The the thing I really want to grab onto here and 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 come back to a little bit is, you know, Chris, you had talked about wargaming as a bit of a pendulum, and I I, I want to hold that thought for just a second, but. But Pete, you talking about, you know, at the time in those interwar years, there was, you know, the war college was war gaming. It was, here's a problem. Let's, you know, let's solve it. Check out. Our, no, I'm kidding. Uh, but like, you know, we, we go through the problem set in, in this class and we're going to use that to teach this lesson. And then, you know, for you, the bell rings, you go down the hall to your next class. Okay. Here's the next, you know, for this curriculum or, or this subject, here's this war game we're going to put on the table and we're going to use it to try and teach you how to solve this other problem to where that, that's what they were doing. I'm sure somebody somewhere along the way has taken a look at the history of, of wargaming at the Naval War College and figured out that at this certain point, that 90% became 80%, became 50%, oh, became 10%. Yeah. And, and they've looked at that. But but the question in terms of like, how do you get back to, assuming there's a desire to, how do you get back to such a high level of wargaming for the instruction? And Chris, where I want to come back to your whole pendulum thing, we're coming up on the 10th anniversary of that that Bob Work memo that came out in the DoD that said, "Hey, we need to get back to wargaming more in the service schools, and and this needs to be a bigger deal, and we need to make sure that we're wargaming all the time at all levels in every class in every place, and and all the folks in the professional wargaming world and folks like me that are sort of adjacent to it all cheered and went, well, yeah, this is great, and then it didn't happen, and I think." That it, Brant's sort of two cents theory on some of this is it's the the biggest part of this is because it it doesn't get back to Pete what you were describing which is this becomes an expectation in every classroom you walk into every subject every week there's some sort of war game happening on the table part of it is the trainers don't know how to do it they don't understand how to in you know it, it incorporate this into the curriculum part of it is every time you change senior leadership like the focus of the curriculum changes so that doesn't help you know, that that, that runs in three-year increments. But the, the people designing the curriculum, and more importantly, the people executing the curriculum, don't know how to do it. So it never becomes an everyday expected thing in every service school from the E4 to the O6 level that every single time you go to some sort of professional military school, there's a war game a week happening. 
because I, that's part of how you learn these things. How do we get I, back to that? I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna actually gonna push back on a couple of your assumptions, and um, because I think I think most of the things you talked about are fixable if that's what you wanted to do, right? If the I issue think is fixable, <laughs> no, no. But so and now I'll and, and I'll get to why they're not fixed in just a moment. Um, you know, if if the issue is is that you, you want to have you know, every course has to have a bunch of war gaming in it and stuff like that, then, then, you know, that, that's just a matter of training people to be able to do that. We used to be able to do it, right? It's not that, that war gaming is so far beyond uh, the, the, the understanding of people that they can't do it. I think the much, much bigger deal is that the mission of the war college, at least in terms of the type of degree that it gives out, mm. is dramatically different than what it used to be back then. It used to be back then that if you were a graduate of the Naval War College, it just meant that you were a graduate of the Naval War College. Um, and that had no relevance whatsoever unless you were talking to somebody else who was in the military, um, it, because it was a it wasn't an accredited degree program. The Naval War College today gives out an accredited master's program. It's an it's a master's degree. It's a, a it's considered a political science degree. It's a it's national security and strategic studies. At least that's what that's what I was told in 2008 when I got my war college degree. Yes, yeah, and the um, the faculty is largely civilian. Um, now there's a lot of military folks there. I don't and they they try to set it up so that in the day school, in all of the discussion sections, at least they used to, that there was a military professor and a civilian professor. But there weren't very many civilians there back in the interwar period. It was pretty much all military. And it was solely about training them for war. Whereas my degree program, so I took a course in strategy. I took a course in um, joint maritime operations, which was sort of the operational level of war. Um, so how, how to plan campaigns. The first course is about why you want to have campaigns and how you can use campaigns to, um, to uh, do, achieve strategic effects and how to think about strategy. And then the, that other course is about how do I do that? And then there's a third course that's everything else. And it included things on on how to interact with your professionals from other countries, right? You know, the Jap, you know, like there was a section on the Japanese in particular because we do a lot of stuff with the Japanese. And I remember one of the readings we had on how to interact with the Japanese said, you know, if they if they're not used to dealing with Americans, you should treat them this way. And if they are used to dealing with Americans, you can you you know if they're used to dealing with Americans, they'll tell you no. If if they're not, not used to dealing with Americans, they'll never tell you no, but you need to be able to understand what a no looks like anyway. But they're not going to use the word no. Well, so and, Chris, you're, you're talking kind of real particularly about the Naval War College, probably because yeah. that's your guys' shared experience. I'm talking about, like I said, everything from, from E4 to 06. And again, going back to yeah. my, my frame of reference is the Army. So that primary leadership development course that you send E4s to to turn them into sergeants all the way up through the War College and, and everything in between. So the basic NCO course, the, the advanced NCO course, right. the sergeant major Under, course. Understood, understood. But my point is the aperture is a lot wider than it was in the old days. And so a, a big chunk of the course is in Newport. Or there, how would you war game it? I mean, it's because it's not about combat. It's not about battle. And there's a lot of things along those lines that from every level um now the the naval war college you they they will let lieutenants in but they generally don't want to let a whole lot of lieutenants in because it's really for lieutenant commander commanders kind of the sweet spot there right people that that have already finished their department head tour and are beginning to sort of bring their their gaze up right bring their gaze up to look at the rest of the world not be about the narrow focus of their of their specific community. And um, they're just, you know, these days, officers have to know a lot more than they used to. And part of their requirement is they have to, at some point in their career, they have to go off and get a master's degree. And so the Naval War College actually wasn't competitive in terms of attracting students who were naval officers until they decided to make it a regular master's program. The joke was people would go to Newport for the golfing, and it was considered kind of a vacation. They weren't I'd have thought they'd have gone to naval postgrad for the golfing. 
<laughs> Monterey. Well, <laughs> you know, but the funny the funny thing about that is is that the Naval Postgraduate School is a hardcore technical school. Right. You get master's degrees from there and you get master's degrees in things with numbers and you write regular theses, theses and stuff like that. I mean, I I've know got it also a, happens to be four miles from Pebble Beach. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> got that you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that Monterey is a hardship tour by any stretch of oh the i know look it's my wife's hometown i've been there a couple of, you know i've been stationed there a couple of times so yeah a, a really good friend of mine is a retired submariner who has a degree in spacecraft design um from the naval war call uh, from the naval postgraduate school and he met his wife there who was getting a degree in anti-submarine warfare so um <laughs> which is just that's a perfect combination right here. it's a perfect combination um so so the thing is is that it's it's not just about you can't fix this problem just by changing the curriculum um because there's too many pressures on that make the curriculum the way it is you'd have to do a much 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 more fundamental reset than just sort of saying like we need to do wargaming in the curriculum the other thing about wargaming like that and, and this applies to the work letter i i'm 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 sure that bob work understands this because bob work is a really sharp guy and he's doing war gaming from the beginning of time the 12th season of mentioned and dispatches is made possible by all of our patreon supporters who pledged at the top level the armchair dragoons would like to thank michael sunborg fred and his dog chet bell hellcat six patrick garrity stagger wing kevin bertram mike quigley martok and joseph Knoll for their support of the regiment of strategy gaming which helps us bring you the best strategy gaming articles, events, and this podcast. You can join us as a Patreon supporter at patreon.com slash armchair dragoons. Wargaming, Wargaming can be for training, it can be for education, it can be for analysis. And all games have a tendency to have bits and pieces of all three, right? There's, there's very few examples of a pure game. Um, training is about teaching you procedures. It's about which button to push when. Um, education is about how to think about the problem. And then analysis is about generating data to, that I can then use analytical techniques on to analyze the problem more. Going back to the war college in the interwar period, most of that gaming was educational gaming that was about teaching students how to fight battles. What we talk about is the analytical gaming that was about War Plan Orange. Now, those were frequently, I don't want to make it sound like, you know, there was this bright line painted down down the side of, you know, across the hallway and they had one on one side and one on the other, right? Um, you know, people learned, there was lots of education that happened in the war plan orange battles, but I'm pretty sure that if you go back and you pull the thread, it's different people that are doing those different things. And we have a tendency to just kind of mix it all up. Yeah. It's the, it's the problem we have with world war two in general is that people, um, and this applies the entire that entire time period. From where we're sitting, it's it's this bunch of stuff that all sort of happened at the same time. It didn't happen at the same time. It happened over 30 years. And it had a bunch of different people involved in a bunch of different organizations, et cetera, et cetera. But to us, it looks like it was just this thing that happened at a time. And you can't really understand situations like that unless you like sort of sit down and figure out the exact timeline of how, of how things came about and who was doing what, et cetera, et cetera. It requires... And, and put yourself in the perspective of what did the people know at the time, right? Um, tiny little sidebar, a few sentences. If you look at those first, say, four carrier battles in World War II, three or four, if you look at the 1942 carrier battles, they were learning how to do carrier warfare. And it was very personal to these guys. And a lot of it was, okay, we fought Coral Sea last week and we got our asses kicked in certain ways. And so we're rewriting all the tactics manuals so the next time we fight them, it's going to be different. And then they go and they fight Midway and they go, oh, yeah, these are the same assholes we dealt with before. Actually, I think it was Santa Cruz and, and Coral Sea that, that, that were the ones that were a month apart, if I remember correctly. And it's like, yeah, those are the assholes that we fought a month ago. And this time it's going to be different because we've rethought all this stuff. Um, it's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of detail that gets lost from our distant perspective. Yeah. And to, to the original the point about the curriculum, yeah, the Joint Staff study, J7 study, basically came out and said, JPME is broken across the services. And everyone goes, yeah, we, yeah, we're, 
I, it's hard to push back against that when you look at what it is joint professional military education was supposed to accomplish uh, and the throughput, the types of students we're going through now, what the curriculum has morphed into. Um, what there is an agreement is how to fix it. And as Chris alluded to, it would take some pretty severe personnel changes uh, and and curriculum changes to try to drag the quote unquote drag the college back to the the old days and whether that's the right approach or not. But what I, with this, the, certainly the faculty is sensitive to it because I did not realize that that especially amongst the civilian faculty at the War College, um, how sensitive they are to that criticism uh, in terms of we teach far too much stuff that isn't about war fighting. So not long after I put together my my, my book report on Ed Miller's book, War Plan Orange, um, I was invited to give it to the president of the War College. And I thought it was just like, he was just curious. Yeah, it, it's sure. I'm happy to show him my my clever PowerPoint book report. And I think it's going to just be me and him. So maybe it's a, it's a few extra people. So I get over to the where we're, I'm giving the talk and the room is filled with a bunch of deans, the provost, Pinwick. Uh, the tribunal. Yeah, tribunal. yeah. And... <laughs> And I'm and an alarm bell should have been going off in my head, but they weren't because <laughs> I'm just like, I'm just here to give a book report. So I give my book report and suddenly I find myself in what felt like a my dissertation defense where I'm getting attacked about uh, the 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 presentation in terms of am I suggesting that we need to get rid of all the civilian faculty that I'm here to advocate for going back to a particular am I going I, I'm just talking about Ed Miller's book. I don't know where you people are coming from, but that's what it was. I later <laughs> learned that, oh, this is the problem of this idea that we have become uh, too civilianized in the faculty. We are teaching too many topics that do not directly relate to warfare. And there is a push to go back. Well, that's a that's a difficult thing to undo. You know, the, the, the bell was rung in the 1970s to shift the curriculum to much more of the of a liberal arts model, the liberal arts college model. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was done with you know malice and forethought. Uh, there were parts that they tried to preserve from a wargaming perspective. Uh, this would, would have been uh, Admiral Turner was the president at the time. And uh, one of the things that he saw, the trend lines, was uh, the computer gaming problem that we were having at the War College. So we get uh, the computer, 1957, we start using the Naval Wargaming system and uh, NWIGs. And it, you know, it's massive. It's the 50s. Everything is you know, it's punch card, mag magnetic tape, uh, the uh, giant, uh, you know, the UNIVAC rack mounted computers. Uh, and one of the, the, the promises of computer-based gaming was that it was going to accelerate game because now all that pesky paperwork and umpires looking up combat tables is all going to happen in the blink of an eye inside of the computer. Well, that was part of the problem. It happened inside of the computer and the computer became a bit of a black box. Wargaming became a black box activity where students would try to come up with moves. They couldn't enter them into anyways. You had to have a trained operator who would sit there and convert their their doodles on, uh, on a chart into commands the computer would understand computer would run and would come back and just tell you submarine's dead and he was like well what happened yeah the submarine died what do you mean what happened and and turner realized that we had lost a visualization activity an important mm -hmm. part of it we had lost a tactile sense of how close did i come what were the odds um did i push the my risk and it kind of got lost in what was again we're called black box gaming so he yeah, wanted this the submarine died was did the submarine die because the probability was that the submarine was going to die, or did the submarine die because a really, really, really improbable event happened? Yeah, I, I, and you can't tell <laughs> with the, yeah. the early setup. So he was pushing for a return to more board gaming, manual gaming, because we could do it faster. Um, it didn't require the massive reset times that. Uh, that uh, NWAGE did or news, the Naval Electronic Worker System required. Uh, and it gave the students more opportunity to command because this is where we started to lose to the fleet. Up until up until the 1970s, the preponderance of wargaming at the college was for the students. We don't have a wargaming department, by the way. This, this is something that is always kind of, because we say the sign, uh, the, the big uh, logo says um, uh, you, you know, wargaming department, wargaming since 1887. True. The techniques were formalized into the curriculum not long after the college opened in 1884. We're, we're using a lot of heavy wargaming techniques as a teaching tool starting in about 1887. The wargaming department as a named department doesn't come along until the computer does because we actually need specialized people to take care of it. <laughs> and this goes back to Chris's earlier comment. Everybody wargamed 
because that's how we taught. It would be like having the blackboard division or the chalk division. It just, everyone just knew how to do it because it's what we did. It yeah. wasn't became, until it became so specialized because of the computer that we have to stand up a separate department now with a very niche skill set. Not that the wargaming part is niche. It's the babysitting the computer part that's niche. And yeah. that's kind of why we end up as, as, a, as that department. Um, but the students lost out. The fleet found out that we had a computer and the fleet wanted computer time. So increasingly, the War College's bandwidth uh, was devoted to supporting fleet commanders who were trying to do campaign analysis, war planning, et cetera. And it's not time for the students. Now, it doesn't, the student time doesn't go away altogether, but it's dramatically less than it had been under the old manual gaming days where it was the teaching technique. So yeah, I, I've think, always liked James Sturrett's point about manual versus digital wargaming in that the model is much more transparent um, and and it's... If you, if you need to make a change to something, in a manual game, you need a Sharpie, not a computer science degree. Right. Right. You're not, you're yeah. not recompiling the, the base code in order to make a change to something or hoping that the, the, the code guys built in an editor for you. Right. You need a Sharpie. Yeah. You know? <laughs> There's an old Avalon Hill game called Tobruk, which is a very interesting game. Uh, people have one of two reactions to it. They go, the game is fantastic. It's just like what an operations research analyst would design. Or they say the game is horrible. It's just like what an operations research analyst would design. <laughs> Um, and the thing about Tobruk is that when you when you take one tank under fire, when you, when you shoot at a target, you go you roll dice against a series of charts, and you go to a chart and you roll the you you start off with you you know what you're firing with, um, and then you roll a die and you take the result of that table and you go to another table and you roll a die and then you do you follow the bouncing ball through about six or seven of these charts. And in practical terms, it's does my round go through the box that the target is in? Does my round um, having having hit the box that the target is in, does it hit the part of the box that that the, that the target is taking up? And so now you start getting into what the target type is and how big it is and what its shape is. Where does it hit? Does it, what angle does it hit at and, and what sort of penetration it has? And you follow the bouncing ball. Now, there's no decision making made. At a, the, the only decision making is at the very beginning when you say, yeah, I'm going to shoot at that target. And then, but you have to do this series of die rolls to get out at the end it could be one die roll it could be a you know roll a d1000 and just look it up and do it all in one step you or, wouldn't or roll five different colored dice and just follow no. your way through the charts you, and you can do that and that but that that is a different player experience because what those charts do is those charts are a model and you can follow the model as it executes now yeah. that D1000 lookup table that you could be rolling against is also the output of the exact same model, but it's totally and completely opaque to the user. And so that's why um, when people say things like, like I, at one point I was talking with a guy who was going to republish that game and he was going, yeah, we're just going to do it as a D1000. And I and the other people that were with me, it's like, no, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. The, the, what seems to you to be a useless die rolling exercise is the heart of the game. Yeah. And, and that kind of goes to the point of what is the point of the game, yeah. right? Because yeah. we've got game, you know, the college plays everything from a uh, strategic deterrence game Games, thermonuclear war down to uh, now we don't go down to the tactical level so much we often consider the tactical level at the adjudication level but the players typically kind of cap out somewhere around operational or what we call high tactical not sure what that means but uh, and again what is it that you're trying to illustrate what is it you want them where do you want them to spend their decision space and where do you need to automate things because it's not of interest it doesn't illuminate the problem that the the sponsor has articulated. So how do I structure the game to get at the pieces that matter? And we call this having, get, making sure the players have agency. Mm -hmm. I want my adjudication process to be sensitive to the, to the levers the players can pull. Because if most of what happens in adjudication is a reflection of uh, engineering, of elements beyond the control of the player, if my player is playing a maritime commander and the most important thing for that DDG to survive the incoming missile attack is that the little tiny pretend captain on the little tiny pretend destroyer turns his ship to put the threat on the beam so he can get more missile directors looking at the down the threat axis. Okay, well, the player didn't make that decision. My players don't sit there and send in, hey, I want DDG number four to turn to zero to zero and speed up to 21 knots. They're saying they're going, I allocated resources to achieve an effect in the battle space. I need an AAW capability out there 
in order to defend something. I need to put force over here in order to uh, shape the battle space in a way that will compel my adversary to move into this more hazardous ground where I can take them under fire. You know, And when those are the sorts of decisions you want the players making, what I don't want then is to have that very generic get sea control on the Strait of Malacca order be what the player submits. And now adjudication gets to play the game where they go, oh, well, if I have this order now to get sea control, I'm going to do a bunch of stuff. Well, wait a second. Who is the player? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, and and this actually goes back to one of the things that I always explain to, to newbies all the time, in, including bosses and stuff like that, right? And and this is the reason why you have to be sort of process-oriented if you're going to be a game designer. Um, and that is you have to get your problem statement correct, right? And you got to work with the sponsor to get the problem statement correct to figure out exactly what the sponsor needs. And by the way, the worst sponsors yourself easily the worst the the worst experiences i've ever had was when i was working for the organization that was the sponsor of the game that we were doing it ourselves um and then the second thing you have to do is you have to derive a set of objectives from that and uh, a set of well-crafted non-exclusive objectives you know things that don't interfere with each other to sort of figure out how you're going to solve that problem statement right and, you know, this is this is just like good project management, right? You got to understand the problem and then you have to sort of define like, OK, what do I have to do for to consider that problem fixed? Right. And so you need to do this in war, war games and the DOD needs to do it in deciding what the war colleges are for. <laughs> to go back to the previous discussion. <laughs> yeah. Right. The problem, it, the, you know, they say JPME is broke, to which my response is, what are you trying to do with it? Yeah. And don't tell me you're trying to make better officers, right? Because that's the sort of wishy-washy response that got us there to begin with. Yeah. And the problem is, you know, I, I think fundamentally with JPME, um, there's, I think, two things going on. One is that there's lots of demands on people's time. And and so you don't necessarily get the best and the brightest always going off to the war college all the time because there's lots of other things for people to do. And, you know, ships are being road hard and put away wet and and there's plenty there. It's hard to get to pry loose swows to go surface warfare officers to go and do things like the Naval War College. Um, so that's part of the problem. But the other problem is, is that they just they just don't know what they want out of it. And they're trying to do everything and they need to and they've come up with a set of of um, objectives that are interfering with each other right uh, i want it to be warfighter focused but it's got to make them uh, it's got to make them you know broadly capable it's got to increase your experience base it's got to be focused on the service but it's also got to meet the demand signal for getting a master's degree um and so you know it has to be a degree granting program because if i get to choose if i'm if i'm only going to let the the navy is only going to send me to one i'm going to get the one that's that's useful when i'm not in the navy anymore and so they haven't defined, there hasn't been the political will to sit down and define what they're trying to do with all this stuff and then come up with a solution. Chris, I want to go back to something you were talking about a second ago in terms of, you know, with, with the war games, you've got to define the problem set and then figure out what yeah. you know ways in which you can approach that. I think that's that's very true of a particular kind of war game. And no surprise, it's the one where you've spent the bulk of your time. I think yeah. the kind of war game that you're using for, you know, giving giving somebody much closer to the front of the battlefield, whether it's, you know, a, a junior officer or senior NCO, somebody in that that last hundred yards, last half mile, the the kind of war game you're going to put in front of them is a very different thing because it's a lot less anical, analytical and a lot less about sort of decision-making practice under adverse or harsh or, or time-limited conditions. That's a different kind of war game than you're using during your deliberate planning process, whether it's the MDMP or, or or some other planning process where the point of the war game is to compare courses of action. That's a different yeah. kind of war game yeah. than, as you mentioned before, that test of destruction. That's a different kind of war game than a doctrine development war game. I mean, there's, there's, and, and I mean, we right, covered this but, during one of the connections online sessions talking about the war game handbooks with the different kinds of war games that mm -hmm. were available. You know, that, that's where I jokingly included the performative war game, if you remember, you know, the, the war game that yeah. you do to, to, to tell senior leadership you did a war game and nobody cares other than the fact that you did one. I call um, that wargaming is performance art. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 
And, and so there's, you know, the, w- when you start talking about kind of the, you know, what's the problem set, I think that's, that's a very accurate and necessary step for a particular kind of war game, but not necessarily all the kinds of war games. And I don't want it, that to I, end up sort of scaring I, people no, off. No, no, from, no, no. Yeah. I'm going to, I am going, I am going to plant my, sp- this is a hill I will die on. Okay. <laughs> this is a hill I will die on. Fundamentally, you st- it doesn't matter the type of war game. You've got a problem statement of some sort and you've got objectives. Now, notice that I didn't say anything about analysis when I talked about any of that stuff, right? The analysis part, part comes later. After that, is, I think, is when they start to diverge, when you start talking about, about um, you know, research questions and stuff like that. You know, if you're not doing research, then that doesn't count. But in terms of, like, defining what your problem is, i.e., why do you think you need a war game? That's where that comes from, right? The people don't just do war games because, you know, hey, let's just do a war game. Well, sometimes they do, and that's the problem, is that they've got an ill-defined problem statement. So, like, so for instance, if the issue is people don't understand their gear enough and they need training, you know, the problem statement is, is uh, people don't understand uh, what they, what they need to do in order to operate their equipment. And there needs to be some way of instituting muscle memory, et cetera, into that. And then you sort of figure out what the objectives are um, that will define whether you've, whether the game is a success by deriving, driving, I always say two plus or minus one is the number of objectives you want. Um, and then that will tell you, you know, whether you've made it or not. And those objectives are a filter that you use in your design process. So like if somebody says, let's have a ground campaign as part of the game. And it's like, no, my guy's an AWACS operator. And this, this game that we're doing is all about test is about training him how to, how to be an AWACS operator. I don't need to do the ground stuff unless, unless the ground stuff is part of his job description. No, but it so, would be no. more realistic, Chris. It would be more realistic if you put the ground stuff in. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I'm I'm so sick of hearing the term realism. Um, we call it the realism and, trap. It's a trap. Yeah, <laughs> it, it is. It really it would is. also be more realistic if they did it in the dark on four hours of sleep well, in mop four without yeah, having a shower yeah. for a week. Yeah, well, so, that's a joke. So if we're going to go for full realism. That's fine. Everybody bust out your chemical suits and you're well, not taking my, a shower for a week. And, yeah. you know, I'm going to come wake you up every half an hour. Yeah, my, that, my my response is fit for purpose because I don't want a war game, for instance, where Red looks where you know Red looks at I'm not going to attack at the enemy base because I think it's too strong, right? If if what I've done is is I'm, I've designed a war game where I where the purpose of this war game is we've put a bunch of defenses at this base and we're trying to get a handle on how we would use these defenses in a battle. I don't want Red to look at it and go, well, I'm, I just, I'm scared. I'm not going to attack that. No, I, part, of, part of the instruction to the Red player is going to be you have to do that. And one of the things I, uh, when I was up in Newport, I was part of something called Halsey Alpha. And one of the, uh, uh, which is a faculty moderated, student executed uh, wargaming research project that's been wargaming a series of related topics over the course of 20 years. And one of the things that, that the Halsey Alpha faculty does is they are both the Red National Command Authority and the Blue National Command Authority. And so the Red the red Cell Commander and the Blue Cell Commander have to do a mother may I. You know, this is what our plan's going to be. And frequently they'll say, hey, that's a great idea. We'll write that down. Some group in the future will get to try that, but that's not what we're doing today. You know, we want you to focus on, it's, you know, we want you to take the Northern Route, Commander. Yeah, right. <laughs> right? Exactly. So it's the exact same thing, and that, that's exactly what was going on there. They wanted him to take the Northern Route, and they had very specific objectives to do that, and they were functioning functioning as the national command authority he was not a totally totally free actor And so that's another thing that's that's interesting in the professional wargaming space is how much freedom do you give the players? Because you don't want to give them too much freedom because paradoxically, the thing that makes wargaming such a powerful tool will come around to bite you in the ass. Um, McCarty Little, um, who's, oh, what was his, William McCarty William. Little, <laughs> yeah, William. Um, who uh, the wargaming building in Newport is named after this, this uh, uh, officer of the early 20th century. Um, he wrote this essay called, um, oh, Pete, help me. What's the name of the essay? Yeah, I'm thinking the name. Is this the one? What, what's the con? Keep going. <laughs> it's the one where he, it's the one where he says that the reason why you war game is because 
um, people basically people are smarter when they're being competitive. Oh yeah, yeah. That, that's where the infamous quote comes. Um, that the, the secret behind a war game is a live vigorous enemy in the next room waiting yes. to pull all sound. But yeah, yeah. I can't even. Yeah. Yeah. But that's the quote. Yeah, it's it's painted yeah. on the wall <laughs> at the building. Yeah, it's paint. Yeah, it is, and it, and it's totally true. And that's why war gaming is one of the reasons why war gaming is such a powerful tool, and why it makes sense to to have people war game rather than just do a structured facilitated workshop all the time. Although a well done structured facilitated workshop is a thing of beauty and i should point out that pete is perhaps the best facilitator i've ever seen at this um but the thing is is that you also have to deal with players that will frequently try to subvert what you're trying to do because they want to win so bad yeah. and they're trying to to find ways around you and so that's why you need to make sure you know the blue cell leader and the red cell leader are creatures of the white cell the white cells traditionally the the control group right they work for game control they are not independent actors this is why and this is an entirely different subject that we should get into at another time but if you go back and you read all the public discussions of general van riper in millennium challenge this is the part where he did not understand or he chose to ignore the fact that he had a boss and that he wasn't the national command authority that he worked for the white cell and so the white cell got a vote on what he was supposed to do because they had objectives they were trying to meet and they needed him to do certain things in order to meet their objectives yeah current yeah, whether those whole... objectives were good or objectives or not is an entirely different right discussion. right yeah because that, it, that's a whole one of my uh, a day's lecture is we use millennium challenge 2002 is the is the poster child for why you don't combo platter live exercise war yes. game, and experimentation all into one event one one of the most pleasing things that has happened to me professionally is at Connections US uh, at National Defense University. I was giving um, the uh, the long version of my no, it was this wasn't the I was going to say the one talk. It wasn't the other that talk. It was the other one. It was my wargaming pathologies talk. Yeah. And I talk about Millennium Challenge in it. And I gave I gave my take on it, and which basically is don't believe the newspapers. I wasn't there. I talked with a bunch of people who were. Here's how I put it together based upon what I've heard was going on inside the white cell and what I as a professional war gamer understand is uh, how the red cell and the blue cell and the white cell should be interacting in what the how objectives work and all the rest of it. And and I so I spent about five minutes sort of laying this out and a guy in the front row raised his hand and I called on him and he said, I was one of the guys in control. That is the best description of what happened that I've ever heard from somebody who wasn't there. Yeah. So, Chris, you'll be happy to know that I take your war gaming, war gaming pathology brief. I give that first, then the checklist that you know is with that when you look for mm -hmm. various things. Then I hand out, I hand it out to all the students. We then watch a video on Millennium Challenge. <laughs> And I have oh, that's go, fantastic. And then I have them go through and I say, okay, so I have my checklist of you know the things that I think that video should have highlighted. What do you have on your checklist? Yeah, you know, in terms of what they spotted as potential pathologies within the construct of the, the execution and the analysis that followed. That's fantastic. I'm glad to hear that that's happening. Yeah, so, that's, that's fantastic. As we start to get closer to wrapping this up, I want to throw this last thing toward Pete. You know, again, this is this is one of the podcasts where we're going to focus primarily on the professional wargaming world. But if we're going to circle back around to the hobby audience for however many of them might still be listening over an hour into us talking about senior service schools and, you know, the, the halcyon days of interwar wargaming at the war college, the Naval War College. But, but seriously, as, as we loop all this back around to a hobbyist looking at how the professionals are doing wargaming and what lessons they might be able to take from that or what ideas they might be able to grab and run with. Are there any particular things that you've seen over your time, over your, you know, several decades now in the wargaming field in, in terms of something that would resonate with the hobby audience, something that would matter to them that they can learn from some of these lessons that we've picked up over the years in the professional realm as you've seen it. Yeah. So uh, I do a lot of gaming for obviously the professional game, but I also do gaming for uh, high school students, uh, sea cadets, boy scouts, different groups. Uh, and obviously, and that is a much more of a, a entertainment and hobby space 
uh, that I'm in. But most of the so from a from a principles of war perspective, uh, even the the most the simplest hobby level game will echo the principles of major modern combat. So it still works. It applies. Mass is a thing. Movement is a thing. Fires matters. Intelligence matters. Targeting. All those elements that often get layered in somewhere. And whether it's as it's, you know, command points like in Tide of Iron, where it's it's just that's the way we've decided to represent it, that's fine. Um, gameplay in general, all gameplay, not just war game, but again, and that's obviously the niche here, but uh, there was a brilliant column that was written in the Wall Street Journal several years ago. And the title of it was basically um, everything my kids know they learn from gaming. And it was this idea that gaming at any level is a phenomenally transferable skill set. And the mistake we make is when we think that our gameplay has to closely emulate the real world or life in general to be of use. And and that's the pushback that this author had, uh, this columnist had, was this idea that any gameplay is good gameplay. The opportunity to engage in an unnecessary problem, right? All, all especially in the hobby, in the hobby side of the house. Um, when you decide to play a game, you have volunteered to spend your time solving an unnecessary problem because that's what every game presents you. It's a it's a problem to be solved. We start with some sort of starting condition. It is not the victory condition. We are now going to make a bunch of decisions bounded by a rule set that if I make the right decisions and interact with the other players around me, one of us is going to achieve a victory condition solve the problem and win. There is nothing uh, life depending upon me playing another game of risk with my kids, but we do it anyways, because all play is valuable. And this idea that it's an opportunity to engage in that artificial world um, and learn how to make decisions under different constraints. Games all pr provide some sort of constrained system in which I have to operate. I have to buy into this world. I have to accept the premise of this world and the way it works. And within those boundaries, try to figure out how to get my little car filled with my family to million their acres, how to how to wipe out all my opponents in a game of risk, how to get all the property in Monopoly. All of that is problem solving. And problem solving, role play, uh, is all crucial stuff. And when you then step out your door and hit the real world, it's not just entertainment. It is fun, but fun has its value in how we shape our thinking and how we preach, approach problem sets well beyond the board game, the computer game, my, my miniatures game, uh, my professional game. So Kind of the big thing that I've kind of taken away with with the, my exposure to the entertainment side, the business side, the professional side is play is good, and we don't do nearly enough of it. I uh, I think that's a a great place to leave this for uh, for this week. That play is good, and we don't do enough of it. So I think you know everybody go play more. It's a good thing. <laughs> Tell them Pete said it was okay. It's okay. <laughs> Chris, appreciate you taking some time to be here. Obviously, folks uh, coming to participate at Connections Online, 15 to 20 April, are going to see a whole lot more of you. They're going to see Pete on screen for a little bit of it, and thankfully, they won't see a ton of me on screen, so that'll be great. And again, Connections Online, hobby folks, please come be a part of it. Come learn more about what the pros do and how they do it, and maybe you've got some good ideas to throw into the mixer that the pros can learn from the hobby side. So that's that's absolutely the point of why we put this together, and uh, uh, and, and to do it at such a low barrier to entry because you can attend Connections Online in your pajamas. It's totally, well, Pete probably can't because he's going to be at the War College. But well, from the waist up or down. Or yeah, well, well, but if, if you've got to walk through the halls in Newport in order to get to where you're sitting to be a part of this, the pajamas might be a little overboard. Just don't wear a nightgown. What, or, you know. what, what happens in New Newport stays in Newport. Fair enough. <laughs> um, but, so, but yeah, so if, go ahead, Chris. If I can jump in for a second, um, you, you have an actual mentioned what the topic the theme of this year's connections online is well, it shouldn't um, matter they should come be a part of it no matter what they, they should they should but it's uh the the, the theme this year is um d distributed wargaming basically what did we learn from covid you know what lessons learned did we learn from the pandemic because everybody had to think about how can i do stuff remotely and you know there's people that have been doing stuff remotely all the time there's lots of hobbyists who do it because you know the single the single most difficult thing about being a hobby wargamer is finding somebody to play a game with um and so the hobby wargaming got into the distributed wargaming thing a long time ago um so there's this topic is going to involve i'm sure there's going to be a lot of people talking about hobby examples because that's where we had a tendency to jump to when covid first um 
uh, happened. I mean, there was a lot of a lot of people re- uh, regretting. Pete and I were ones uh, mm-hmm. or two of them, right? That the skill set, the, the I'm sorry, the tool set that we had on the unclassified world was so much better than the skill set, uh, the tool set that we had on our classified networks. Mm-hmm. Um, because, you know, like I can't use Discord on the classified network. I can't use Tabletop Simulator. I can't use Vassal. There's a whole bunch of specific gaming tools out there that were just not available to us. Well, one of these days when we're all in person, buy me a beer and ask me about the Xbox on the Cipernet in Kosovo. <laughs> it's a great story. <laughs> oh, yeah. Weird shit always happens when they're deployed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Th- this this one's a per- particularly entertaining story. So, um, no, cool. Uh, guys, thank you all very much. Um, yeah, I, I know I we, we promised an hour. We're up to an hour and a half. And, you know, look, with Chris here, that's actually cutting it a little short. So that's fine. Um, but, but, Pete, we do appreciate you stopping by and joining us. And hope you have a chance to come back and join us again on a, on a future episode down the line. Um, Chris, we know you're going to be back because, you know, you're always here. And, uh, and we appreciate I'll see it. you next March, if not before. Yeah, <laughs> well, uh, generally we get you here about once a season. So, you know, probably have you back in the fall for sure if you're not back again this season. Um, and then audience, thank you guys for joining us. And, uh, and, and we hope you got something out of this discussion of professional wargaming. We'll catch you next time on another episode of Mentioning Dispatches.